question. Uh, you have 10 minutes to answer this question during the lecture of uh, the next speaker. And the next speaker is uh, Antonio Rubino. Antonio Rubino is uh, working as a consultant in anesthesia and intensive care uh, department of Papua since 2014. He is currently the transplant lead uh, for anesthesia and critical care. He also covers the role of regions lead for organ donation within the national uh, health services for blood and transplant and is currently leading, along with lead cardiac surgeons, uh, the national pilot program for DCD uh, heart in the United Kingdom. So Antonio, welcome. Uh, we will all listen to your presentation. So thank you. Eric and um, good evening everyone. Um, thank you for the nice introduction. Um, as um, I don't have any conflict of interest, if we can say this might be a conflict of interest in the way I might, I'm, uh, yes, I'm lead for transplant in Papot, but I'm also looking at the other side, actually what comes before the transplant from a, on, on a regional perspective. So I'm regional lead for um, organ donation, which sometimes the acronym doesn't sound really well for the um, English people when I said I'm such a clot. This is where I'm from, um, Royal Papot. We have a new home. Uh, a couple of years ago, we moved to a new hospital with uh, over 30 ICU beds with the plan of expanding this bed. And mainly, we are doing what we were used to do in the old hospital. So we were used to do heart and lung transplantation, having some experience with mechanical devices and treating them then heart failure patients overall and doing other specific procedures like pulmonary and arterectomy as well. This is a graph you could see in the, from a couple of years ago. So we are taking COVID away when we are talking about pre-COVID. And Papua has always, busy, has always been one of the uh, busiest centers for um, heart transplant uh, overall. This is where I'm based my um, uh, lecture. So these are the uh, articles and reviews. So a very comprehensive review from uh, the group from Toronto General published a um, couple of months ago in the Journal of Cardiothoracic and Vascular Anesthesia. The international guidelines from the ischels of the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation. And then there will be a part about, I will probably continue the great talk from Nandi about the DCD. I will just bring up our experience in Papua as well, um, giving you probably some update about the what whether there is any difference in intensive care on the management of intensive care of these patients overall. So I'll start probably, and this is how I started probably my, uh, while I, 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 press, I uh, build up the slides and the presentation, so with the main question, so do we really do something different on uh, heart transplant patient in intensive care compared to other cardiac patient, compared to the very complex cardiac patients overall? And uh, I would say probably, Clearly, the answer is yes, and especially because there are some critical points, and critical points probably that are, I would say, almost critical hours after a transplantation, where it's important probably not to miss that clinical uh, signs or deterioration on those patients. And this is why probably is important to have uh, uh, even more on these patients a uh, 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 clinical team, so a uh, multidisciplinary team, so not just intensivists or the surgeons, but as well as usually these patients are look, well looked after as well, uh, um, cardiology, transplant cardiology. So it's, uh, it's, I think it's probably the, the, these type of patients usually do well when there is a multidisciplinary team looking after them. And starting probably from the early post-op goals, clearly we are looking, we are aiming to have a, a pneumothemia or improving oxygenation and a, 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 um, optimizing the volume status of these patients. And clearly on these patients, as we heard, the, there is some coagulation issues, probably more than other patients. And especially the more we go in these days because of the more we operate on complex uh, recipient uh, overall. This is what we aim clearly, um, and this is probably what doesn't differ from our normal cardiac patients. So an early extubation, having an, weaning the anotrope as 
quicker as possible, or well, let's say rather than quicker in the best way possible, and proceeding with the normal post-op cardiac care. But what we probably do differently, and this could be a point of discussion on these patients, so one of the things that we do different in the in terms of monitoring is they always come with a pulmonary artery catheter, um, because the, the, the first hours, what we feel is the first 12, 24 hours or 36 hours is where probably these patients need a probably a closer monitoring overall. And this is what we aim clearly to discharge these patients in the uneventful transplantation, uneventful IFU stay. This could happen in between day three to day five. So usually these patients could stay if everything goes well, the same time than a normal almost cardiac patients. But is, it is not a normal patient overall. And we, starting from physiology, we know the um, there is a loss of autonomic nervous system regulation. So there is a cardiac denervation, which, what does it mean? It means that the heart is clearly hard that is not able to regulate, to change its heart rate like it would normally do. So it means that if we think of the cardiac output, probably the component related to the heart rate, it doesn't change straight away, but is possibly directly dependent from, it is directly dependent from the circula, um, circulating catecholamine. It does take a while probably, or anyway longer probably than usual to respond probably and to have a change in heart rate, hence a change in cardiac output overall. And these are hearts that are probably more preload dependent. So donor heart, per definitions are good heart, at least starting with. So it's where we use probably the Frank Starling curve, is where we then hopefully aim to increase the cardiac output with increasing the preload. And as we said, there is a cardiac denervation, which it does make this heart not responding to drugs that are normally working on the autonomic pathways, like jagoxin or atropine. And they are still working, clearly we are still using, and they're still responding to beta blockers, so drugs that are working on beta, on beta, on beta receptors. What is important clearly is to optimize the understanding actually, as we said, this good heart starting with as per definition, whether these are still good heart in the in the first hours of the intensive care. So it's actually try to optimize the ventricular function and the systemic perfusion. And one of the common the commonest probably problem that we're having in intensive care with these patients is clearly is vasoplegia overs and vasodilation, which is related to different reasons to different causes overall. So is uh, um, related to um, uh, the complex of the procedure, is related to the most of the time the complexity of the recipient as well. More often we are doing transplantations on patients on long-term LVAD and is, is related to uh, long-standing heart failure medication like ACE inhibitors. So there are a lot of uh, confounding, a lot of a lot of factors which are actually making these patients probably vasoplegic for the first hours of the time they're staying in intensive care. And this then that balance between inotropic support and eventually vasoconstrictors in trying to support the right ventricle and try not to increase probably the pulmonary vascular recipient, the pulmonary vascular resistance overall. What about fluid? So it's possibly an easy, um, uh, not an understand, uh, understatement, but saying that the heart transplant, as soon as it's coming out from theaters, is possibly a heart which will need fluid. So it's a heart that is preload dependent. It's possibly, we need to be careful clearly with fluids on, and we need to be careful in, in saying that. Because clearly, yes, it, if it's a, the, per definition is a good heart which is responding to fluids, but clearly we need to be careful of the right ventricular failure and we need to be careful of not creating ventricular over distension, especially if we then associate this one to a hypoperfusion due to uh, vasoplegia that we can have. So is it probably important what we usually is, is to, to leave probably theaters relatively dry overall, to fill these patients if we can, either with colloids or crystalloids, and probably our preference goes for colloids or overall. And then if we feel, if we see that there are clinical signs of volume overload, like high CVP and um, 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 pulmonary, um, high pulmonary artery diastolic pressure, low cardiac output, and this is why usually we use a um, pulmonary catheter, then is there where the 
rapid response, the rapid interventions matter. Is that one of the key points that we said that could change the outcome of these patients overall? And then in taking the different the, um, uh, actions as diuretic and optimize volumes and clearly optimizing volume and optimizing inotropic support. We mentioned we heard about the primary graft dysfunction. We heard about the cause of primary graft dysfunction. And as you can see from probably from this slide,